Good evening. This uh, is, again, the programme about books, and all that happens is just that an extract from a book is read out by Richard Herndl or by John Moffat, and then the people sitting here try and discover who wrote that particular piece. These people are Bernadine Bishop, the novelist. Good evening. Anthony Blonde, the publisher. Good evening. Anthony Burgess, Good the novelist. Good evening. And John Gross, who's a fellow of King's College, Cambridge. Good evening. And the first extract, then, is read by Richard Herndl. Can you say what I say? I'll say anything as you say, sir, for I know it's good. Our Father. Our Father. Yes, that's very good, sir. Which art in heaven. Art in heaven. Is the light a-coming, sir? It is close at hand. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy... The light is come upon the dark benighted way, dead. Dead, your majesty, dead, my lords and gentlemen, dead right reverends and wrong reverends of every order, dead men and women born with heavenly compassion in your hearts and dying thus around us every day. Splendid. Mm. Bernadine Bishop. Dickens, Bleak House. Right for you. Yes. Death of um, little Tom, I would say, isn't it? Joe. Joe. Joe, that's right. You're thinking of death of little Nell, perhaps. No, I'm thinking of death of little little Joe. (laughs) Tom all alone. Mm. Oh, Tom all alone, yes. Yes. Would you have got that, Anthony Block? No. Not within a million miles? Um, Within a million miles, yes. Who, for instance, did you think? Just for fun? I thought uh, there was one echo, forgive me, the, the first opening thing, I thought it was um, a, a comic episode for the first three lines of Shakespeare. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> it's That's a million know. miles, <laughs> isn't it? Anthony Burgess, did you recognise it? Yes, I, I got that it was Dickens, but I, I didn't know which book. Could be, I, I, I was going to say A Tale of Two Cities first, but uh, that seemed wrong. Possibly Bleak House was written about that time, was it? The tone seems similar, I don't know. But uh, there's, a, there's an intensity about it which is uh, at the same time relieved by a uh, deliberate exaggeration which is comic in a special way. It is, I think, purely Dickensian. Of course, it could be imitated, but one might even say, uh, no, not Wells. Uh, I thought of Kipling, The Light That Failed, or something like that. But uh, Dickens, definitely Dickens. John Gross. Oh, I think unmistakably Dickens, mm. and one would have to be you know, almost as good as Dickens to imitate it. Mm. In a way, I'm a bit cross because this is not typical Dickens, or rather it's typical of one side of him. I don't think it's typical of um, the really great Dickens. Um, Perhaps that's why we put it in. But, well, if one, provided one's not going to laugh at it, as people do at Little Nell and so forth, it's a very powerful piece of rhetoric, I think. And he particularly, I think, had a propaganda purpose in mind uh, when he's writing Bleak House. He got very interested in public health attempts to uh, control cholera and so forth. In general, he didn't believe very much in government or government interference, but he certainly did in this novel. And as I say, I think if you detach it from its context, it looks like one of his more religious deathbed scenes. But if you think of it in the whole novel, it's part of a really very admirable campaign for proper public health, proper control of Now, of that, that really interests me, because I would never have thought that Dickens was what you might call interested in these social problems which he pretends oh, to... Passion. Could I just say this? Uh, which he pretends to be interested in, um, um, the debtors' prisons, and in his own case, the blacking factory. It's more, it seems to me, um, the strength of these preoccupations is the strength that might arise from a child's nightmare rather than from a a sociological document. Well, for him, of course, the blacking shop and the debtors' prison were a child's child's nightmare, nightmare. literally. I think that uh, this extract from Bleak House is a bit untypical. Um, He has got a real disinterested campaign about a social... Uh, evil here, which he doesn't usually. Yeah, but it doesn't sound like that, does it? Does I'm it, Bernadine surprised, Bishop? I'm surprised that you say that, it, that it's untypical, Dickens. I should have thought no, it was very typical. typical indeed. I mean, you have the slight, you have the embarrassing deathbed scene, if you like, embarrassing. But on the other hand, the, the feeling behind it is so strong mm. that I would have thought he, it rarely, he rarely carries it off. Now, could I say this? It's a particular <clears throat> aspect of Dickens's genius, uh, what one might call the the thespian, or the dramatic aspect in the, in the sense of the stage. I mean, Dickens was an actor, possibly a good actor, and p- but possibly uh, Taylor Two Cities came into my mind because he got the idea of that, did he not, from, uh, from a play originally, 
uh, a play in which a man sacrificed himself for uh, the woman he the loved. The Frozen Deep. The Frozen Deep, that, that was the one. Wilkie Collins and he would yes. dance, something like that. And there was the sense of the audience, the, uh, the rhetoric, uh, and then the sudden appeal uh, to, to a court, to, to, to an audience. Yes, but Ten mm. Cities isn't polemical like Bleak House, is it? Well, the first chapter, I would say. You know, the, it was the best of times, the worst of times. Uh, he was and very he interested in yes. questions of the day. And it, I mean, he was definitely involved and completely compassionate. One of his novels is about delays in chancery, is it not? It's not about that at well, all. Well, I mean, this is, this is touched on. And for instance, the one thing which is rather moving, I think, when he wrote about that school, you know, Wackford Squares and all that, he yeah. went to Yorkshire. And went make round it, these terrible schools. I, I really I must mean, take it up an argument with you here. Perhaps it's not the chairman's function, but I can't help it. He, not, he thinks he's interested in these things. Well, he's, why bother to trundle up on that clumsy post chaise? Uh, people have done, he did. People have done stupider things than that, or, you know, and then written a book which they could have written out of their heads. He wrote it out of his head and his experience. And I think he only thought he was a saint. Uh, that's not, that's, part, that's he partly true. Uh, he, he did feel these things strongly, but he didn't really believe in social reform. He believed in the exercise of individual philanthropy. Uh, but uh, if he'd thought about it at all, surely it would have come to him that individual philanthropy could do very little about the Yorkshire schools and about the debtors' prison. Right. Right. Well, at the risk of being pedantic on this one, I do think Bleak House is a bit different. Dickens was very much opposed to um, busy bodies. He was against the idea, perhaps, of government interference. But at this time, when he wrote Bleak House, he did, this is perhaps a big anomaly in his career, he became very interested in the public boards of health which are being set up. They're being set up, this is a curious thing, um, by Edwin Chadwick, who was also the man who'd been more than anyone else responsible for the poor houses, the workhouses that Dickens was getting at, in Oliver Twist, of course. In general, the kind of man that Dickens was most opposed to, but this was a period in his life when he did plunge in to genuine social reform, and this is one reason it's untypical. Of course, in a way, the kind of great and absolutely irresistible waves of self-pity that come through this passage are typical. One must I wonder, I was going, could I just ask you this to turn off the sociological tack a little? Um, do you regard the feeling in this as sentiment or sentimentality? I don't think you can use either term properly. It's, um, it, it is a kind of cold rhetoric. It's a kind of, um, it is essentially a, a, an actor's pose. The actor knows perfectly well what he's doing and he's trying to engage, gauge the effect of his words on his audience. He's aware of his audience, he's aware of himself uttering these words. And I don't think the content matters all that much. It's the, uh, the force of emotion. Uh, feeling about the things in question doesn't really come into it. But is it, is it equal to the object to which it's directed, or is it in excess of it? I mean, is it sentimental, or is it, or is it um, equal? It is can't be an excess. The emotion can't be an excess. It's not an, it's not an excess. It's not... It's not quite genuine, it's a bit operatic, because, for example, uh, Dickens wasn't a very religious man, and he nevertheless plays on the full organ pipes of religion on, at his deathbed scenes. Um, if I got a bit cross, it's... And if I said it was untypical, it's more that I'd... I've heard Dickens laughed at so many times when this kind of passage is torn out of context. If one um, looked at the character of Joe in the rest of the novel, if one has seen Chad Band, Mm. browbeating him, has this brother to Ruth, you know, he has not to Ruth, and yeah. so forth. Um, it's a kind of cumulative thing. I think it's much more powerful coming at the end there than it is... It sounds say, more sentimental, I think, I must say, I can, no, I ask because my own feeling is that it's full of sentiment, that's to say, full of a genuine, authentic feeling, yes. however operatically deployed or... or, or yes, or absolutely. yes, I think so, and I think we're wrong to feel embarrassed for Dickens when a passage like this comes up. I, I doesn't, don't, but I don't... No. I, don't feel, I, still, I still maintain the emotion itself is not probably geared to the subject that uh, it is its own excuse, it's there for itself, nothing else. The Dickens is the artist in one sense here, and not the social reformer. Shall we go yes. on and do something else? This particular piece is read by John Moffat. My father always assumed, as I do now, that anything new was likely to be nasty. Barbara found a specific charm in modernity. She did not pursue novelty. She was no butterfly of fashion flitting from vorticism to dadaism. She was rather subversive by tradition, a spaniel lolloping dreamily along at her mother's heels. I argued sturdily with her, but I picked up many of her arguments, which I reproduced next term in my essays, with the result that Mr. Howitt, in my report, made a rebuke which I have seldom incurred in my later years. He must learn to approve those things that are excellent, not merely those that are ultra-modern. You got it, Anthony Blount? I put down Nancy Mitford or Evening War, but it's probably a man. Ah, that was very good. 
I think you must have that, even oh, more. thank you. It's the first one I've ever had. Is it really? It's, <laughs> not, really. it's not frightening <laughs> important, no, you know, no. one way or the other. It's the, or presumably the autobiography. Yes. Yes. And um, ve very readable, gentle, easy stuff. Not, not astonishing, I thought, in any way. Bernadine did Bishop, you? did you recognise it? No, I didn't. I haven't read the autobiography and I wouldn't have got it. But I liked the passage. I mean, I knew perfectly well that I hadn't read it. It made that much impression on me. But, um, I, I, yes, I think, one, I think one could have placed it uh, with regard to a period quite satisfactorily. Yes. Yeah. Did you get it? Uh, it? Yeah, I, I got it, yes. But um, hearing it like that, uh, torn out of context, uh, I was quite prepared to, to see it as part of some uh, very minor novel of the 19, late 1920s or early 1930s. And uh, it seemed to me then to be full of uh, the usual sort of uh, cliches of attitude, vorticism and dadaism, and uh, again the the usual sort of uh, the reproof. You know, the uh, what, what's the final the final line? He must learn to love those things which are excellent. Well, excellent. Those that are not, not, yes. not just those that are merely. But modern. of course, we we ex uh, I don't think we could excuse that in a novel, but we can excuse it in, in an autobiography because an autobiography is about real life, and uh, real life needs an excuse. Tom Gross, did you? Spotted. Yes, I got it. Um, and I think that, um, following on from Anthony Burgess, that the autobiography is written in a much flabbier, more kind of you know, sitting in the club armchair style than Waugh's novels. Um, I'd like to make the excuse for him that it's tongue in cheek. I think the episode it comes from is um, a very interesting one in the novel and very revealing one. Barbara, if I remember correctly, is the fiancé of his brother. Mm. And the entire autobiography is really about someone who has studiously, deliberately turned his back on the modern world while knowing exactly what he's doing and yeah. really knowing all about the modern world. And Barbara mm. is the one episode, he treats this poor girl uh, very sardonically. Uh, he's still a schoolboy at the time. I found out then, for example, from this passage that one of the first things he published had been a defense of cubism, written when he's about 14, under the influence of Barbara. And poor Barbara has to carry on her shoulders the whole burden of everything that's modern, you know, Picasso and plastics and sunbathing and socialism. I wonder, <laughs> I wonder if you think that his tongue is so permanently in his cheek that it impairs the communication. No, I think this is a perfectly straight autobiography, rather a slack piece of work. I don't think he should do another. I, I'm a great admirer of his style, his wit and his storytelling. And um, it's quite interesting to see that none of the uh, snobbery of which he has, in my view, been very justly accused is explained in this autobiography. I mean, even was reckoned never to have recovered from being to Lansing and Harford College, in spiteful. Well, he, seems, he does seem to, to me in this, this particular book, to have inflated his style to a point where he appears actually to be patronizing the events of his own life uh, in a, such yes. a continuous way as to mm. rob them of interest, in such a way as to neuter yeah. them. The events of his whole life, or just the events of oh, his Oh, of this, I beg your pardon, just this particular section. Yes, uh, yes. It's, it's not an exciting book, is it? I mean, I don't think, well, the material is not exciting. No. Uh, the, uh, one is rather shocked to find the lack of interest in literature, the nastiness of, uh, of the young boy, the, uh, the, 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 flabby, uh, the flabby, unpleasant, unspectacular sins he commits. But the whole thing is redeemed by this, um, by this pastiche gibbon style in which the book is written, of which that, of course, is not a good example. That sounds yeah. like... Uh, a not very good novel. But do you remember Brideshead? Yes. Sure. When Brideshead revisited, which was the kind of ur book which all undergraduates enjoy. I remember one wild Australian coming to my room saying, "I am a synthesis of all the characters." You see, and this this was lovely. The way they lolled around, smoking their fat and dull number elevens. None of this comes through in the autobiography. Well, he was ashamed of that. He became ashamed of that style. Did he he yes. uh, rewrote Most Brighton. of it doesn't come through, and it's very interesting because he covers the same ground, and it comes mm. out flat in reality, whereas it was very sparkling in the novel. Bits and pieces do. I remember in the stuff about Oxford, um, the description of the club called the Hooster and Proterin Club, which yes. used to live backwards, mm. get up, uh, dress in full evening dress, drink whiskey at 10 o'clock. But do you remember, so do you remember whether he was able to convey this information to you straight, or did he, as it were, have to cock it at an angle, as though he were acting in a, in, in a continuous cocoon of icy disdain. Oh yes, um, for the most part I think he did. Um, a sentence which stuck in my mind, describing this Oxford period, he says, uh, a period in which he 
plunge too heavily into social life, he says, um, I was somewhat too promiscuous of my familiars. Um, tush, tush. Mm. Upon that note, mm. shall we move on? <laughs> and the next piece is read by Richard <laughs> Herndl. He said that for general improvement, a man should read whatever his immediate inclination prompts him to. Though to be sure, if a man has a science to learn, he must regularly and resolutely advance. He added, what we read with inclination makes a much stronger impression. If we read without inclination, half the mind is employed in fixing the attention. So there is but one half to be employed on what we read. He told us he read Fielding's Amelia through without stopping. He said, if a man begins to read in the middle of a book and feels an inclination to go on, let him not quit it to go to the beginning. He may perhaps not again feel the inclination. Anthony mm. Burgess. Well, that is uh, Boswell's life of uh, Dr. Samuel Johnson, Lit D, I think. Uh, do you take uh, exception to the doctor's advice there? Uh, no, I think the doctor said the, the final bit of advice the doctor gives is, 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 is very right. I doubt if I myself have uh, read a book through in my life. Ah, uh, no, he, he didn't say it there. Well, he said if a man begins a book in the middle and has an inclination to go on, uh, he should go on. Yes. And uh, I, that, that leads on to the fact, of course, that Johnson read very few books through. He knew more books than anybody, so Boswell says. But he'd never, he'd read very few books through. He admitted that. He admitted book. that. He, he used a book. He tore a book to pieces. He made it part of himself. He didn't uh, allow himself to be enclosed by the book. Didn't uh, Boswell say somewhere that um, he had wonderful power of tearing the heart out of a book? Mm. <laughs> but it is not. I don't think it ought to be an example to all of us. Bernadine Bishop, don't you just love that Dr. Johnson? Well. I, as, I, as I listened to the passage, not being able to place it, I'm afraid, I did get the impression of rather a good uh, educator talking, uh, being talked about by some keen disciple. But um, I don't know that this idea of just, of, uh, of just following one's inclinations. I mean, he must perhaps have had very strong inclinations about reading anyway. He's obviously he was in he a did. position to I indulge I mean, I don't them. think all of us <laughs> would ever read at all no. if one followed. Don't you think the passage was, in fact, rather ugly and difficult to listen to? It is very much the mark of a, of a shorthand diarist tape recording sort of mind. Well, he said, the repetition of, he said, and the inclination. I do I hope you're right, because sometimes I think Boswell invented it all. Do you? I mean, it's that good. No, he, he must have been the most tremendously attractive and good man, Johnson. I mean, we know he suffered a lot of pain. He never really was very bad-tempered and always in such a thunderingly complicated way that you, you know, you were touched to be uh, the object of his attention. I don't think he ever hurt mm. anybody. Mm. But I think it's an awfully boring bit, and I don't think it's a very exciting book. I prefer the anecdotes that other people tell him. Oh, yes, well, they're not going to give you one of those on this no, program. No, they want course. to test your, mm. your, your in expertise. I think um, he was a fine old leg puller. Um, Dr. Johnson, and I wonder how much he was kidding. He didn't like fielding, of course, and um, I wonder if he'd have said the same for a novel or a novelist that he really liked. I bet he read lots of novels through from cover to cover and didn't miss a word. Well, he read, he, he must be one of the very few men who read the whole of The Anatomy of Melancholy. He, he says that he used to get up early in the morning, I forget how early, 4 o'clock, 4 a.m., to start reading uh, The Anatomy of Melancholy. Of course, he couldn't, couldn't sleep, sleep well. He was, as you uh, remember, not, not a man who could sleep. Couldn't get and up he easily, though, either. Either. No, too. Yeah. <laughs> Something I always wonder is how definitive were all these opinions which were so faithfully recorded by Boswell. I mean, didn't Johnson perhaps, like everybody, say one thing one day and another thing another day? I'm sure he was pestered beyond belief, you know, <laughs> to answer <laughs> academic questions by this chap who was yes, always there. Yes, surely, that's so what I was We're a kind of feel. comedy team, in a way. Yeah. <laughs> he was a very limited man, in a way. Remember, he, he couldn't understand Bishop Barclay's theory, and yet he had to make a sort of smart point of it, so he kicked the stone by the door and said, Sir, I refuse to... We refuted oh, that. Much more yes. than a smart point, I think. I well, think that is the, the ordinary human reaction to it. I think he had one very colourful thing reaction. to do. I think having if Boswell around would push anyone into a yes, position Christ. of having to have an opinion yes. about everything. Mm. Anyway. No, but he did in general, I think. Um, and he you know, was a wonderfully funny man who didn't take himself in deadly earnest. He described his style of talking, you remember, as talking for victory. 
whether it was <laughs> Boswell or anyone else, he had to rather, not say crush people, but get the better of them. And he knew that he wasn't to be taken in deadly earnest. And I must say, I think Boswell must have been an appealing man in his way, otherwise it wouldn't have happened. I remember the, the first time that Johnson, perhaps uh, feeling a little pressed to do so, but the feeling comes out much better than that. They're sitting together, and finally Johnson says, Give me your hand. I have taken a liking to you. Mm. And I think that's one of the most moving lines yeah. I've mm. ever read in my life. Mm. Oh, yeah. Well, that seems to have ground the conversation. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got on to the next one, which I believe is read by John Moffat. Alas, said the mouse, the world is growing smaller every day. At the beginning it was so big that I was afraid. I kept running and running, and I was glad when at last I saw walls far away to the right and left. But these long walls have narrowed so quickly that I am in the last chamber already. And there in the corner stands the trap that I must run into. You only need to change your direction, said the cat, and et it up. John Groves. I'm stumped, I'm afraid. I'm a... Take a wild, wild guess at something like Saki. Now then, Anthony Burgess. Yes, indeed. Um, it's not a translation. May, may I ask that question? It is a piece of English literature. Um, no one said it had no, to be a piece no, of English literature. No. I think I'll tease you along a little and not tell you. Not, no, quite. Uh, I would say about that period, I would say a very self-conscious imitation of Aesop or La Fontaine, uh, written by a, a, a sophisticated man, a man with his eye on the times. Not Saki. No, it's not. Uh, I don't know. Anthony Blonde, you seem to be on the verge. No, no, don't know, but in, it, couldn't, it couldn't be Sarkis, because they're famous stories in the Toby Mori when the cat starts talking. But as far as I remember, the cat only talks to the other people in the room. It's so embarrassing that they finally strangle it. I don't think the mouse chats away. It's a bit more sinister than that, though, don't you but think, it, this bit? Is it, is, it, uh, is it earlier than that? I know you're here to say. <laughs> <laughs> Bernadine Bishop, do you know? Conveyed absolutely nothing. Nothing at all. No second thought. It was written by Kafka. Oh. oh. Ah. How clever of uh, Professor Burgess then to, why? to ask mm. him as a translation. Oh, yes, it was. Oh, that's yes, that's why I wouldn't tell him. Yes. 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 Uh, uh, what's it from? Is it from the uh, diaries, the notebooks? Or I'm going to turn it up and see. It's called A Little Fable. Mm. Nasty little fable, too. It is. Mm. It's like a spoiled is epigram. Is Does that it? the whole thing? Is it that little, I mean, the fable? I haven't the remotest notion. No, no idea. But do you, now you know it's mm. Kafka, and uh, you all said, oh yes, oh yes. Why mm. are you saying, oh yes, oh yes? Well, I'm not saying, oh yes, at all, on second thoughts. Uh, it doesn't sound like Kafka, really. Uh, Kafka can only be appreciated at some length. If, if you read the, the diaries that, that Max Brook edited, uh, the little epigrams, the little aphorisms that Kafka comes out with are not uh, very telling, very pregnant. Uh, you have to appreciate Kafka. You can only appreciate Kafka if you if you get a long chunk of him with um, a character suffering at great length and uh, as in the trial, waiting perpetually for something to come of this long, this endless. Uh, but he's talking about I walls. Know that isn't I yes, there yeah. is that rather yeah. short piece. Um, I can't quite remember what it's from now, but it's about a doorkeeper. It's quite a short piece with something mm. of the mm. um, rather strongly horrifying. Uh, tone of this little fable. I mean, thought he's best at length, though, isn't he? <laughs> oh, not I, at yes, all. I mean, well, he's, he, he, he's going to be good at all. If he's good at all, <laughs> he's good at length. He's good when he can um, use the peculiar rhythm, the peculiar flat rhythms of his prose to, to uh, lull you into a sense that all this world is real. Is this read in the original? Well, in English, too, I think. Yes. Hands up anyone who thinks he's a terrible bore. No, I don't. No, I don't. Uh, no. you obviously do. And move no, not really. It's <laughs> just flying a kite. No, no, no. Now, what touches and moves you about Kafka? Well, the f the fear that he has of everything. No, he's yeah. a very frightened man. Mm -hmm. And these extraordinary long distance love affairs, when when he um, was sitting on a square and said to his uh, girlfriend, with whom he's been corresponding, for heaven's sake, when you do come and see me. Don't cross the square it's direct, just come, or do cross the square so that I can see that you are you. And then, of course, at the last moment, left a note and said, I can't face it after all. I think he was the original frightened man of the 20th century, which is why he's so 
uh, much quoted and so much relished and so Left original. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 He's, a, he's a great allegorist, isn't he? Uh, he? He tells the truth. The, the story of the trial is, is a true story. That's the position we're all in. Uh, well, it can be regarded as an allegory of original sin, if you like, but I think the castle uh, presents uh, allegorically and with great power the situation we're all in, the, the sense that we have to do a particular job, we're given orders to do it, we don't know who, who's giving the orders, all we know is that they're living in a castle there, God, if you like, the forces that control our lives. Uh, I feel that to be true, I feel, I feel that to uh, present uh, my own feeling about life, that man is not capable of running it for himself, reason doesn't help, nothing helps. Except yeah. using yeah. the self up. Possibly, instead of regarding it as, is quite colourable to regard it as a prison, which he does. But if you put it to use, you can get out of it or have the illusion of getting out of it that way. Do you think so, John Gray? Yeah, I think that this means that he's not one of the very greatest writers. I mean, King Lear shows people in just such a trap. But uh, inside the prison cell, they are still, you know, three-dimensional people with blood in them. Mm. Um, in Kafka, they tend to be rather wan and ghostly before they start. Uh, this means, I think, that he's not uh, quite as great as some of his admirers have claimed. But uh, beyond that, I think that um, he does tell one uh, great truths about the human condition. Mm. Um, it's very interesting that one could interpret the trial in an indefinite number of ways. Mm. It's not, uh, it's not a, an allegory with one meaning, it's a mm. kind of fable which uh, does seem to me to correspond to whatever sense of human beings uh, being trapped or imprisoned or frustrated one may have. I do agree with Anthony Burgess though that um, he's much better taken at length when he creates a whole world, when one feels oneself trapped in the world that he's created. Over a short distance, I, well, like this one, I thought fables without a moral, just uh, almost a bit of wanton cruelty. One mm. needs to get into his world to be convinced by it. There is that in him. The, the, I think the cruelty of the uh, long short story, Metamorphosis, in which a young man is turned into a gigantic beetle, and the uh, varied uh, attitudes which his parents take up pity, uh, loathing, fear, indifference, and so forth. Uh, seem, that seems to be a, 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 both a very powerful uh, summation of the human position, but at the same time, it is, it is wanton. It, 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 is, it is wanton, and it is sadistic, if you like. It's as though... There's a desire to, to, to be cruel. Yes, he, it's as though he's much more interested in having someone turn into a beetle than he is in the responses that might follow. Mm, exactly. When you say cruel, don't you feel he identifies with the victim rather than with the persecutor? I mean, isn't, isn't he more masochistic than sadistic? Yeah, masochistic is a better well, word. Well, sado sadomasochistic. Yes. yes. Well, nice long word, right? now another one. This time it's read by Richard Herndl. Suddenly she paused, and through my fingers I saw an awful change come over her countenance. Her great eyes suddenly fixed themselves into an expression in which horror seemed to struggle with some tremendous hope arising through the depths of her dark soul. The lovely face grew rigid, and the gracious willowy form seemed to erect itself. Man, she half whispered, half hissed, throwing back her head like a snake about to strike. Man, where didst thou get that scarab on thy hand? Speak, or by the spirit of life I will blast thee where thou standest. Grand stuff, Bernadine Bishop, who wrote it. I'd have it. Yes, very good. Oh. Well done. It's astonishingly yes, yes, clever. Very good. Is it she? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Have you ever read it? You must have. No, done. oddly enough, I haven't. <laughs> you just, it was just a guess. There are putting some books together, that yes. you know without reading, aren't there? Mm. Putting putting the style uh, together with the fact that it was obviously about a she of some. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's jolly good. What about Anthony yeah. Blonde? I uh, didn't get, I'm delighted it's right, Harry, because um, I, he's one of the, the most exciting, I mean, his stories are almost the most exciting I've ever read. King Solomon's Mines, for instance. You know when the man is going to have his, going to be put in a pot, and he says, well, supposing I tell you there's a, uh, a going to be a new moon, or a partial eclipse, I think it is, of the sun, and he's taken out some diary that his wine merchant gave him before he left, and he's right, and he's saved. It's a lovely piece of invention. <laughs> Oh, I, I have, in fact, uh, read She. I read it as, as a young boy, and I also saw the film. I have uh, a very strong recollection of the old silent film. I, I remember the name of the hero, which is Aisha, or Asher. And I also recollect that the book was a most scholarly one. It was full of uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics. 
Uh, I was a young boy, as I say, when I read it, so I wasn't able to interpret these. Well, of course, I can't know either, but uh, the, the thing struck me as being, uh, being, well be, be, being, rather more, being, being rather more than an adventure story. But there's one terrible moment in the book when uh, she uh, leads the young, blonde, Nordic uh, hero, who's destined to be her eternal consort to the, to the fire of eternal life. She enters the fire to renew her youth, and she turns into something subhuman. And a character called Holly, the sort of uh, comic cop, he says, look, she's turning into a monkey. A wonderful moment, and the, the thrill is still there with me. I think it's yeah. a great book. You read it, John Grace? No, um, King Solomon's Mines, and that's as far as I go. But uh, I think I'd have guessed it. Uh, the Scarab it was a bit of giveaway, mm. I think. Um, <laughs> what is a scarab? It's a beetle. Oh, ah. yes, yes. Um, a shard. It seemed to me tremendously of its period, as, as well as Ryder Haggard, mm. that kind of pagan, rather erotic, uh, rather exotic <laughs> kind of writing. Um, can't quite put my finger on the quality of it, but it does seem to belong with, shall we say, late Victorian academic painting, you know, Alma yes, to Dama and that kind of thing. You've got, in order to throw your, if you're a lady, in order to throw your head back with, a, like, a snake about to strike, you've got to have the right kind of neck, haven't you? It can't be one of our <laughs> modern, chunky girls. <laughs> I, I had a feeling, funny enough, of a pre raphaelite painting of a, of a long girl with a very, very long white neck, hair down to her shoulders. Any, any, you, you see, you, know, you know quite a lot about it, and you, you like it, obviously, his, his stuff. Any moral in it, any attitude, any style of life betrayed I, by the book? I leave that to our professors it? on your left. I just enjoyed it as, you know, adventurous stuff. I'm sure you're quite right. I yeah, just I wondered. Don't know. I think it's a very it? simple moral, isn't mm -hmm. it? You mustn't, uh, you mustn't look for eternal life. You must learn to grow old gracefully and uh, not ask for too much. Very simple moral. I Seems reasonable. I yeah. didn't recall, just from King Solomon's Mines, that there was um, quite a lot of imperialism oh, and yes. white man's burden about mm. it as well. Um, or poor man's Kipling. <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, we've got, I think we've got time for uh, the next one, but only just, it's read by John Moffat. On a very slowly moving band, a rack full of test tubes was entering a large metal box. Another rack full was emerging. Machinery faintly purred. It took eight minutes for the tubes to go through, he told them. Eight minutes of hard x-rays being about as much as an egg can stand. A few died. Of the rest, the least susceptible divided into two. Most put out four buds, some eight. All were returned to the incubators where the buds began to develop. Then after two days were suddenly chilled, chilled and checked. Anthony Blonde. Heavens. Chilled, chilled and checked. Two chills, were there? I there were. Know. It's a um, very creepy piece, isn't it? 20th century. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> good, good lad. <laughs> um, no, I don't know. It's not Huxley, is it? I don't yes. know. Yes, mm. yes. Now, you, say, mm. you should, you know, gamesmanship. You shouldn't have said that quite mm. so casually. No, <laughs> I, anyway, no, that was very good. Did you spot it? Yes, mm. yes, indeed. In fact, it's my least favourite, I think, of Huxley's books. But um, why is that? Do you think? Well, it's, I think he gives way in it to his uh, rather horrible um, uh, mechanistic sadism. Which, I, which one feels in a very slight way in most of his novels. There seems to be an absolute orgy of it in Brave New World. I find the tone objectionable, though I think the imagination is, is marvellous. Anthony Bird. Uh, I want to admire the book greatly. Uh, I think the idea is, is a colossal one, uh, an idea of tremendous importance. I think it's very, uh, philosophically, it's very, very profound. But I think it's spoiled by a good deal of inattention to detail, and it's sloppily written. Uh, I can only say that I wish I'd written it. I wish I'd had the idea. Oh, I yes. wish I knew what Huxley had known. Uh, the notion of uh, this confrontation of a world in which uh, a young savage is brought up solely on the works of Shakespeare, and this world in which Shakespeare and all imaginative writers are banned, and you have as a substitute a uh, school of emotional engineering, I think this is a, is a great conception. But it's... Oh, do you really? Do you mm. think so, I think John it's a great Rose? conception. Yes, I think it's his best book, actually. Um, the kind of mechanical or... Um, emotionally clumsy side of him, which uh, to me rather mars most of his novels, is here a real strength, because he after all is showing a world in which a kind of uh, mechanical sadism has taken over does and he satirising. Does he succeed in showing it, or is it simply a debate 
which he is convincingly or not. Oh, I think much more than the bed. I f feel it's um, a smothering world. Um, I feel stifled by it, and consequently, when the people discover you know, a single line of Shakespeare, um, mm. one gets um, a wonderful kind of shiver from this, a tiny spark in the darkness. Mm. Well, on that very positive note, I'm just going to have to tell you all to stop, because that's the end. Uh, that's all there is, and the next programme will be on Wednesday, the 9th of December. Until then, I bid you goodbye.